Welcome to Discovering. When we talk about mushrooms, we're usually talking morels. But our woods are home to a wide variety of mushrooms, including chaga. Chaga in the notice obliquus is actually a heartwood rot. Oftentimes it occurs where there's been an injury. Stick around, that's all tonight, right here on Discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. Call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill. The eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure. The only way I measure Feelings that I have for this fine land There is so much to discover When you're a long-time lover Of northern Michigan great time of year here in the UP. It seems every day something new is beginning. The snow and ice are all but gone. Birds of all types are returning from their wintering grounds. The nights are alive with the wonderful sound of frogs. Mushroom pickers wait for the word that someone found a morel. Of course this time of year also marks the end of some of our colder weather activities. It's the end of the chaga picking season. Chaga, sometimes called the king of medicinal mushrooms, isn't much to look at but is gaining in popularity for its health benefits. What is it? Where is it? How do we harvest it? And what do we do with it once we take it home? Before hitting the woods on a chaga hunting mission, I paid a visit to the UP Chaga Connection in Kingsford to learn a bit more about the mushroom we were hunting. A lot of people are probably wondering, what is chaga? Well, chaga is uh, a medicinal mushroom that grows on birch trees here in cold northern climates. Uh, a lot of things that uh, chaga can or may help with are things like... Um, Inflammation, for one, uh, people that have cancer, uh, diabetes, uh, high blood pressure, cholesterol issues. There is a plethora of things that chaga can help with. We actually have people who harvest uh, mushrooms, chaga mushrooms for us, and other mushrooms certified and state inspected. We sell tinctures, creams, body butters, we make teas lip balms, shampoo. We make everything all natural, 100% all natural products. Uh, we make it right here. We have a certified licensed state kitchen. We try to make it into something as pure as what Mother Nature has given us. Anything that uh, we can come up with that utilizes every bit of that chaga so it's not going to waste. We also educate people. We educate people on harvesting. Harvesting is done during the winter time only. Don't over harvest. If you're going to use it, use it. If you're not, don't go pick it. If you're going to pick something small, uh, for instance, the size of this is maybe good for personal use, but it doesn't have a lot of medicinal use. It does have good properties, but when we talk about harvesting, we talk about harvesting a lot bigger pieces. These pieces are probably 30 to 50 years old on a rough average. They are producing very high quality medicinal product. It's time to hit the woods in search of medicinal mushrooms. I joined up with mushroom hunter Matt Williams, owner of the Shiitake Creek Mushroom Company, for a chaga hunt. So what is chaga, what isn't? Um, first you got to start with the tree. Chaga only grows on birch, period. All right. Uh, not all white trees are birch. This is an aspen tree and as you can see it has some dark wounds which are similar to a chaga in appearance, especially from a distance. Especially when you look at this one, it's got a little bit of an orange tinge in there. Chaga doesn't grow on aspen. However, morels like aspen a lot. So um, if you have an aspen grove, which is kind of what's going on here, there's mixed popple, birch, etc. cetera here. Um, you know, there, there's always a chance that there could be something great coming off of this tree uh, around the bottom of it, or maybe some oysters or something later, but definitely not chaga on this guy.
paper birch. Beautiful tree, and as you can see, we have chaga. This one hasn't been harvested off of it yet. This is uh, chaga in the notus oblicus. It's actually a heartwood rot, so it usually comes from within the tree outward bursting through but it, oftentimes it occurs where there's been an injury or a limb in particular is broken off or a woodpecker's drilled into it or whatever it may be. This is way too small to harvest in my opinion. You know, there's so much bigger, better chaga out there. Uh, this one I actually took say three, four years ago. And it was pretty big, but as you can see, the way I harvested it with the saw, it's not only coming back in this place where it was, but it's spreading and that's perfect. You know, uh, sustainability is a huge issue facing everything right now uh fungi are no different so four or five years now and it's coming along decent size there'll probably be another five before i take it maybe even ten that's how slow these guys grow if this tree died at any point i would take it because once the tree's dead the medicinal value is gone um and that's about it if it found it fell over you know tomorrow or whatever i would take it off there but that's about it um a lot of people think oh you take the chaga and now it can't sporulate and infect other trees. Well, that's completely untrue. It actually won't sporulate until this tree is dead. And the spore bodies actually come from behind this bark in here, etc. So taking the chaga, no effect on it spreading whatsoever. Um, just be careful because you can kill the tree. And obviously it's a renewable resource if treated right. This chaga on this tree may be providing medicinal value. Not only keep this tree alive, multiple other trees here in the area as well and so uh we're gonna poke around see if we can find a little bit more eh more on the not a chaga all right this is a maple tree and that's a burl that's an anomaly within the tree it is not chaga make a beautiful bowl or, or other piece of furniture but as far as medicinal value goes it's just wood it's not a fungus right up above me they're not always down low but they're not always up high that's the one we're gonna take today, right here. A nice little guy. We're just taking this so you have something to take home. It's hard to reach that one. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use a little good old fashioned American ingenuity, flip saw, walking stick, duct tape. Sharp flip saw. I sprayed it down with alcohol. I don't wanna go spreading diseases from tree to tree. You don't cut in a tree, it's not an issue, but not everybody's perfect. I want to cut, but I want to leave some on the tree. And always watch out for dead limbs coming down on your head. See, I didn't get into the tree. I left a nice chunk here. It's gonna come back. Chaga. So it should be moist. If the side of the tree is still alive, if it were completely dry, it'd be a different story. Nice little palmer. This bark, you know, don't be like, get rid of all the bark. You wanna keep that bark because there's actually quite a bit of antioxidants there. So we're gonna bag this up. We're gonna take it back to Kevin at UP Chaga, who's going to dry it in his drying room, cut it up, grind it up, and we're gonna turn it into tea. Beautiful little chaga. Let's say a couple of these per person per year is all you need. There's no reason to go just pillaging, uh, taking as much of everything as you can find in the woods. It, it just won't serve you any good. Maybe if you've got a large family, I could see it. Uh, you know, but this is kind of becoming a finite resource. So, uh, you know, we definitely want to keep it around for the next generation, the generation after that, because the generations before us left it for us, you know, so we want to pass it on. So into the bucket. When we get down this kind of like fir, birch, ash, aspen type lowland, swampy lands, there's a very high moisture in here as evidenced by all this moss going on and uh, dense shade. And this is kind of like a good mushroom habitat. Let's just say that. Uh, this is where I generally will find reishi. So I'm looking for hemlock trees in particular. Um, or the stumps of hemlocks. Usually hemlocks grow in clusters, so where there's one, there's generally more. 
Um, and this is where I'm gonna find the reishi. And what actually happens a lot of times is this. They come in here, they do this, or you cut the tree down, tree falls down, etc. Now the reishi shows up. And so I'll see it like, basically like that. Break it off. These guys, even though this one's from last year, nature has dried it out for us. And uh, reishi is a very potent antiviral. One of the things we're actually using it for right now is in our blend to, uh, to save the bees. So we have a, a blend that we call the mushroom juice that we're working on. And uh, we actually feed that out to bees. Bees like us have an immune system uh, identical to ours for the most part. And so what helps us helps them. And they will actually visit sites like this as the year wanes on and uh, the sap oozes out to kind of heal that wound. And they'll take that sap or that propolis and go back and patch up their hives and things like that. And there's some antiviral properties that are associated with that too. Especially if there's a reishi growing on here, there'll be reishi mycelium. And you'll actually see bees suck on that mycelium to get the antiviral properties out of it. It's kind of a neat thing. Our mushrooms went directly from the woods to the grinder as we headed back to UP Chaga to turn our harvest into something usable. Given time and not a ton of pressure, Chaga can become quite big. Most of these specimens we see in front of us were actually one or two big ones that were, had to be cut up multiple pieces to be removed. They can be quite large. This is kind of my favorite style, right? I call these Chaga horns. They can be any shape, any size, way up high on the tree, way down low. Little ones, big ones, some as big as your head. The longer you let them grow and manage them, uh, the bigger they're gonna get up until the point the tree dies, obviously, and then they're no good anymore. Um, so we're gonna swap this live wet one out and we're gonna let it dry here. And that's what's going on. We've got them on cardboard, we've got a fan going, we've got good uh, airflow through this area. We just want them to naturally dry. And that's why they've been cut down in size. One of the bigger issues with mushrooms across the board is mold. Uh, molds eat the mushroom just like we do. And a lot of times when people get sick from mushrooms, it's more often than not the mold that actually made them sick. So we're gonna get this guy with the, uh, the cut wet surface right here. You can see the darker color of the, the moisture up into the air and get him in front of that airflow. And we're gonna swap him out for one similar size. I'm gonna take this guy, nice little guy, lots of bark. If you have a bandsaw and you can cut it up into smaller pieces, that helps. Um, good luck cutting it with much anything else, um, hacksaw would work, etc. But the goal here is to get it into smaller pieces. A lot of people use a, like a spice grinder. It will kill them, and I have killed grinders doing that with these hard mushrooms. So this guy's uh, a nice industrial model. In we go. Put this clamping lid on here. <laughs> Okay, let's see what we've got. And then we should be there with our beautiful powdered chaga. We can see we've got a nice consistent grind here. I like a, a somewhat finer grind like this. I personally like a little silt in my tea. So we collected some other stuff while we were out there today. We're gonna make a nice little blend. Chaga is known for a variety of things from general immune boosting uh, to more specific things like um, exceptionally good for helping regulate the blood sugar. We're gonna get some turkey tail in there. And like I said, we're just gonna make a nice little blend. And a little bit more turkey tail won't hurt anything. And we've got our reishi in there as well. This is a member of the reishi family. There are multiple members of the reishi family that are found in Michigan, in Wisconsin, up to four. And we're just gonna use this one, Janoderma suge, which is most commonly known as the red reishi or the varnish shelf or the hemlock varnish shelf, their number of names. Okay, I'm gonna let that dust settle down and we're gonna get ready to put it in a container. Because these are all nice and dry, they're shelf stable. Um, you know, if I had picked the turkey tails and the red reishi previously and dried them, if you pulled them all out from the woods, obviously there would be a drying process along with the chaga right now. But once we have them good and dry and we grind them up, then uh, they can go in a shelf stable packaging. If you're really worried about maybe there's some moisture in there, you can always put it in the freezer. It pretty much will last indefinitely at that point. Um, 
until you pull it out and it thaws out that that thaw freeze cycle encourages molding a lot and there we go nice blend and then from here really it's what you want to do with it the tea is so pleasant i hear it all the time people say you know mushroom tea mushrooms i'm kind of iffy on to begin with you know i'm not a big fan of the taste or texture or whatever it may be this is not like a sauteed mushroom you know where you've got the texture and all that this is actually a very very pleasant tea a lot of people mix it with other kinds of tea um it's not gonna give you a ton of energy like green tea black tea etc would it's just chock full of caffeine or uh like yerba mate with the ephedrine but it is going to uh it's going to put some weird pep in your steps. Hard to describe. Like I said, it's very, very pleasant. Um, a lot of people just are surprised at how delicious it is, especially people who drink tea. So you can see this made a lot, a lot more than most people would think. You know, you know, this is why one of the reasons I always tell people, you know, you don't have to take a lot is because it grinds up to more than you think. Those few little mushrooms filled up an entire quart jar and, uh, Whenever I drink a cup of coffee, I'll maybe put about half of a tablespoon into a pot of coffee. And then with my carrot cup, I put about this much. It's not one of those things where, you know, more is better. It, it's a dosage thing, you know? So if I'm making like a gallon of sun tea, for example, put about a tablespoon in or so, and I'll probably drink that for three days. I just enjoy it. And I know it's good for me. The science is there. If you're skeptical about medicinal power of mushrooms, um, go online, be your, own, be your own critic, but do it objectively. Uh, go see what the University of Washington, University of Mississippi, Harvard, Yale, Johns Hopkins, uh, NYU, etc. Look at what these universities have to say. There are vetted DOD press reports that uh, one of the mushrooms we collected today from a birch tree is a uh, cousin to uh, the known cure for smallpox, the only known cure, and it's a trademarked registered thing. You go online and look it up. Um, so I welcome you to, uh, to get on Google and see for yourself. In the meantime, really what's the worst that could happen? You feel a little bit better and you drink some delicious tea. So going out to uh, the Youper Stop or God's Grocery Store, as we like to call it, um, and uh, see if you can find some medicinals for yourself and your family this year. The season for chaga is when three quarters of the leaves on the deciduous hardwoods like oaks, etc., have turned color in the fall. That means that the trees have entered their dormant cycle. At this point, taking the chaga does not really harm the tree if you nick it. Obviously, you don't want to nick it because you want to keep the highest probability of that chaga coming back year after year. The chaga season generally concludes when the trees begin to swell the buds in the springtime and that's they have broken dormancy so one to two weeks before that which we're right at the end of the the period right now of dormancy so as we begin to see the softer hardwoods like aspen or some of the underbrush begin to grow right that generally signifies that dormancy has been broken um, maple syrup guys know all about this because it's called bud swell and bud swell taint it taints the maple syrup so you have to be very conscious of the trees beginning to grow at which point the sugar takes on a, a foul or displeasing taste some people say some other people say it doesn't birch trees generally begin their sap run at the end of the maple run the same thing the tree is broken dormancy now it's sending up sugars uh up into the tree that's when the birch season for birch sap making begins so if you do have a birch stand and you make lots of birch sap Basically, when the sap season starts, the chaga season is over, or the end of maple syrup season, or right about the end of maple syrup season. As the season to harvest chaga comes to its close, we look ahead in anticipation of the season of the morel. So it's early spring here in the Northwoods in the UP. Uh, we're in northeastern Wisconsin, just over the border today, um, near in the town of Aurora, where uh, the, my, my business, Shiitake Creek, is located. And uh, as you guys can see, you know, there's still quite a bit of snow in the woods this area faces south so it melted fast but it, as soon as we dip in here I expect to see quite a bit of snow and ice still and everybody's kind of stir crazy right now from being in the cabin uh, all winter etc and this is a great time of year to get out in the woods if you're a deer hunter or a turkey hunter you don't just go in during season and hope that something happens you've got to spend the time scouting so 
everyone thinks, you know, our morel season is only from Mother's Day to Memorial Day here in the UP. That's not at all true. It's more like six, six seven weeks, to eight weeks long. And it starts in a progression and it goes with different species. The first ones to show up are the true black morel or Marcella angusticeps. Unlike the yellow morel, the black morel is spread out. You may find one every 50 feet, every 200 feet, whatever it may be. So you really have to work for them. You do have the advantage of not having a ton of underbrush blocking your view. And so when I'm looking for these, I'm looking for big old popple trees, the more the better. And then when I look at the ground, I'm looking for specific features that hold moisture in the ground or warm up sooner. Like as we can see these rocks right here, the sun hits those rocks and warms them up sooner. That means the ground temperature is warmer. So what I'm kind of doing is I'm looking right along here, you know, this spot right here, perfect little spot blocked from the wind, nice couple rocks here, south facing exposure, etc. South facing hills will warm up first, west facing hills next and then east, then north. Out away from that, underneath all this insulative leaves and other forest stuff, it's gonna be chillier. However, right up on those rocks, that soil temperature is gonna be much higher surrounding it. And so that's an early spot or a microclimate. And those rocks and other features laying on the forest uh, floor also retain moisture, which morels, of course, like all mushrooms, love moisture. And so uh, as I'm looking around, I'm looking for little tints of leaves, especially if it's raining. That's personally my favorite time to go uh, or the day after a rain. Um, one, the rain helps the mushroom grow faster. Uh, you know, two, more importantly, it lays down all these leaves so they're not dry. And when that happens, it's easier to see things that are small on the forest floor. And what it'll look like is a little tint, a little leaf tint. And I always like to get low and look high. That means I'm eye level with the slope. And so I'm more likely to see that little tent and maybe even the thing underneath of it. This is the end of the Chaga season and the beginning of the morel season. This is a fantastic time to get outdoors and uh, start looking for mushrooms and get to know your land or the places where you're hunting for the morel season ahead. Well, that's it for this week. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you next week right here on Upper Michigan's very own Discovering.